Um, yeah, so the, uh, is this on? Yeah. So the title of my talk is uh, Why No One Can Tell You the Weather for the Year uh, 2100. Well, no one can really tell you the weather for next week, um, let alone 85 years from now. But I, I, the point I want to make with this title is that actually there's a really big difference between global climate and regional climate. And really the, the main point I want to make today is that yes, we understand global climate. Yes, we can actually make pretty good predictions, we call them projections, about global climate and what is go what's going to be, um, to be in stock for us on a global scale depending on how much fossil fuel we're going to burn and how much CO2 we're going to put in the atmosphere. But on a regional scale, we really have very little clues. Really don't very understand how regional weather patterns, how regional precipitation patterns in particular are going to change. And I, 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 I hope that then towards the end of my talk that that would then really be a nice bridge to the next two panelists who are going to talk much more about agriculture, about rainfall, and about this local scale. And I, I think the, th the key thing you need to remember is this, this, this phrase that says, well, nobody lives in the global world. We all live in our local area, and it is our local area what you should care about. And climate science for the last 20 years, I think, has not cared enough about the local environment. So let's just start with the facts. Um, I am going to say that there is no discussion about climate change. The world is warming. We are very certain that the, wor the, 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 the world is warming. There's now been five large IPCC uh, reports since the 1990s, uh, amassing all the data, uh, uh, all the measurements that have ever gone in, and we very clearly know that the temperature of the world has been rising. This is the, the overall map of temperature rise at the surface of the Earth in the last 100 years. Everywhere essentially on the world is getting at least a half a degree warmer, except for this tiny spot south of Greenland, which is in the ocean where nobody really cares about. Anyway, um, most of the land is actually warming faster than the oceans. So 70% of our, of, of, of our Earth is oceans, and if we talk about global mean temperatures, we, we combine the, 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 the land temperatures with the ocean temperatures. The oceans, just because they, are so, um, they have such a high heat capacity, because water has such a high heat capacity, actually the oceans don't really um, warm that fast. So the average 0.8 degree or 0.9 degree of warming we've seen actually means that on land we've already seen much more warming. Already drilling in down to this point that I want to make that global mean temperature doesn't really tell us very, very much. But it's not only temperature that's rising. In fact, every single fingerprint, as we call it, of climate change, every single indicator of climate change is going exactly the way that we think it would if we would burn CO2. So the way to interpret this slide is if you would take an undergraduate physics student and you would, who, who, who knows nothing about climate change, and you would just ask them to use thermodynamics and to use a little bit of environmental science to do a thought experiment of let's put, uh, let's double the amount of CO2 in our atmosphere. What's then going to happen to our experiment? They would come up with these indicators and they would say, well, we've got more humidity, we've got a higher temperature of the ocean, doubling of CO2 would mean lower snow cover, it would mean lower glaciers. Every single one of these indicators is actually going in exactly the way we predict under climate change. There is no evidence at all against climate change. And I think that the whole discussion about whether climate change is true, and fortunately we've kind of passed that point, but every now and then you still in the media get a little bit of a rupture of somebody suddenly burping out something about climate change not being real. That just has to pass, right? We are here, we know what has happened, I think the real question then is um, what's going into the future. But if you don't, you can really simply say climate change in layman terms. And that's essentially, uh, oh no, um, before that. So, 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 we know, so we know the climate is changing. The question is then, well, who's to blame? Why is the climate changing? And also there, we have very clear evidence that actually it's humans that are doing this. And the best way to show this is this set of experiments, and this again comes from the IPCC report, where they did um, two sets of climate modeling studies. One um, without 
humans on the planet. So only you're, you're using what's called natural forcings. And th those are the blue lines here. Um, so what's shown here is the temperature of the land surface on the left, the land on the ocean surface on the right, and the, the, the ocean heat content on the, on, uh, or, or the land and the ocean surface in the middle, ocean heat content uh, on the right. The blue lines in each of those would be what the temperature would have been if we would have solar activity variations that we've seen over the last century, volcanoes that we've seen over the last century, all the kind of natural things that are going on in our climate, sits, um, in our climate system. And you see that on all of those, roughly the temperature wouldn't have changed in the last century. Now the pink lines are what, what the temperature would have done if we add CO2. So what the, what the temperature has done according to the, to the models if we add CO2. And the black lines are the observations. So you see that, say, if you look at the middle one, the, uh, the land and ocean surface, so up until, say, the 1970s, 1980s, really there wasn't much of a difference between temperature without humans and temperature with humans. And it's really only been since the 80s that the two have diverged. And really that we now know that we couldn't get the temperatures we are observing, the black line, without actually incorporating um, fossil fuel emissions, without incorporating the doubling of CO2 that we've done um, because of all uh, the oil we've been burning. So what does this then summarize to this movie? This is a climate scientist. Today, he will try to explain the most recent study into climate change. Observe surface temperature anomalies from three different data sets, including Hadford 4, provide further evidence of unprecedented changes to the climate system. He said it's getting hotter. And here to translate is Roy. G'day, I'm Roy. I'm your translator. No one out there understands your science talk. And I love science, so I need to bridge the gap. Carry on. Climatologists have reached further consensus that human activities are the primary cause of destabilization. Please stop that. Temperatures could rise by up to 5.4 degrees Celsius. Therefore, post-industrial carbon emissions need to be kept at 1,000 gigatons. Right. Uh, what the doc's saying is the world's getting hotter because humans keep burning dirty sh** like coal. How sure are we that humans are to blame? 110%. Well, 110% is actually not possible. So we need to find a way to keep coal, most of it, in the ground. How was that? F***ing awesome. For the in-depth analysis and the simple translation of the latest science on climate change, go to climatecouncil.org.au. Um, that was actually the only time I've worn a lab coat since high school, I think. <laughs> I don't do lab work. Um, so we know the climate is changing, and that's all fixed. And, and I think that the really interesting question, and where we have to go as climate scientists, is to try and understand what is going to happen in the future. And what can we predict based on um, emission scenarios, and based on policies, and based on what we will do with our... Um, greening our economy and greening our energy systems. Now, this again is IPCC work where we've done a huge number of simulations, a huge number of forecasts, climate model projections as they're called, of what global average temperature will be. So the black line here is what we've seen so far. It's the uh, 0.8 or so degrees increase um, from 1950s to 2000. And then you see this divergence coming up. There's the red, the red lines, which are all the models that are, um, that are based on a scenario which is very unpoetically called RCP 8.5. RCP 8.5 essentially is business as usual scenario. It's a scenario where we talk about climate change, where we have meetings about climate change, where we have ministers for climate change, but we do absolutely nothing. We just go on on the way we're doing it and we keep uh, our energy, energy systems, we don't change anything. That will get us, by the year 2100, four degrees warmer than pre-industrial um, uh, pre climate. This is a world that is very, very different from the one we live in now. This is very much within our, our options. If we don't do anything, then this will happen, four, four, four degrees warmer. The other option is what's called RCP 2.6. This is a very ambitious scenario. This is a scenario where we think that we can actually change our, uh, our, our energy systems, that we can get rid of all our fossil fuel burning, 
and we get to a scenario where we stabilize temperature to within two degrees, and maybe even to within one and a half degrees. But that's a whole other discussion, I guess. Now, what does this mean? Well, I think the, 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 the most interesting graph of climate change, it came out of the last IPCC report, but I think it's a, this essentially tells you everything you need to know about climate change. Um, and I think that the IPCC was very politically uh, courageous, I guess, to put this graph in. Because what this graph says on the y-axis is the temperature anomaly. So it's the, the warming we've seen compared to pre-industrial times before, before we started putting uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere on a massive scale. And on the x-axis is the amount of carbon dioxide we've, put in, uh, we've burned since the pre-industrial times. Now, the black line here is what we've done so far. Uh, so the starting point is zero, zero. This was 1860. There was no temperature change yet. There was no um, carbon emissions. And over time, we've moved further and further and further down. We've now almost burned 500, um, mil 500 gigatons of carbon, and we are getting towards the one degree of climate change. See how linear this line is. See how very simple global warming is. Global warming is simply a linear relationship between the amount of CO2 we put in the atmosphere and the warming that we get back out of it on a global scale. These other lines, the blue, the, 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 the orange and the red ones, are the scenarios again. Those are the scenarios from the last uh, slide. The red one is the, the business as usual scenario, where actually by 2100 we get all the way to that point on the top right. That's the scenario where we burn more than 2,000 gigatons of coal and we get this four and a half degrees or so of warming. So what the choice for policymakers really is, is to see how far we want to go towards the top right in this graph. Where do we want to end? Where is our 2100 point? And where is our 2200 point or our 2300 point or our 3000 point, I guess? Where do we want to move? This is our slider that, that we have. This is our strongest policy instrument because it really tells us that if we change anything on the x-axis, if we do anything about carbon dioxide emissions, we are going to change temperatures. In other words, every single ton of CO2 emitted will change temperatures by a little bit in a very linear way. There's not very much feedback on a global scale. It's all a very simple pro problem. I hope that this is a problem that our politicians actually understand and that this is something that we can communicate. Um, and I think that Paris actually showed us that now the message is getting across. And that now finally, because what we did in Paris, the COP21 meeting, that slowly societies are getting to come, uh, coming to get to grips to what this graph means. And the problem is now actually translating that into policies and translating that into actual actions. So that's global mean temperature, right? I, I, as I said, it's a simple story. It's not difficult, everybody can understand it. It gets difficult once we get to local temperature. What I started out with, nobody lives in, on the globe. Everybody lives locally, everybody cares about their local weather, their local temperatures, their local precipitations. And then we really need to get, the problem of local temperatures is that our models just aren't good enough yet. Our models essentially are, are Lego bricks. They have this very coarse binning of the world and we solve for the temperature in each of these grid cells. And since the 1990s, we've made huge progress, as you, as you can see. We, we started out with um, essentially the UK, UK just being one grid cell, just being one temperature, one precipitation for the entire UK. We're now getting more better, but still for regional temperatures, for, say, the difference between temperature in London and temperature in Manchester, our climate models are not yet up to that. And that's because our computers are not up to that, because this takes so much computations. Most of the biggest supercomputers in the world are actually churning out climate projections at this moment. That's what we, we, we use them for, for narrowing this down and making this a finer and finer and finer resolution as we move on to get better handle on what the regional climate is going to do. So what does this mean then for, um, what did the IPCC report say about this, this regional climate change? Well, what you see here are the change in the average sea surface temperature. So, so far, I've just shown you one temperature rise for the entire globe. Now, here, the IPCC has gone out and 
separated it out by region. On the left is this RCP 2.6, the fast action on climate change. On the right is the RCP 8.5, the, the business as usual. And what you see suddenly is that this average four degrees of warming actually has a very large spread. And that there's regionally very big differences on the red there, where in the Arctic and in Canada, um, you can have temperature rises up to eight or nine degrees, double that of the global average. And some other regions get less, but again, those regions tend to be over the ocean where, where, where maybe we don't care that much about, um, about, uh, about temperature rise. Now, below this graph here, um, I've put a, a really simple line there. Stippling, the models agree, hatching, the models don't agree. So the way we do this is we don't have one climate model. We have a whole suite of those. That's actually the numbers that are printed there in small, the, the 32 on the left and the 39 on the right. Those are different climate models. They're made by different groups. There's a Canadian climate model. There's a UK climate model. There's a few US climate models. There's an Australian climate model. Everybody puts them together. And then we look uh, at agreements in the patterns between these climate models. Now, except for this tiny, tiny blob again there just south of Greenland, essentially all the models agree that the world's getting warmer. And all the models, that's the, the stippling that you see there. It's only a little bit of hatching there south uh, below Greenland. All the models agree the world's getting warmer. It's getting warmer over land and over the ocean. It's getting warmer in the Arctic than uh, in the southern hemisphere. So we're pretty clear on temperature. But now let's show you precipitation. Pre precipitation is not at all as easy to do. And actually, I think that the thing that we need to get better at is to try and understand how precipitation is going to change. Precipitation is key, of course, to agriculture. It's key to our water security. It's key to so many things. And this, these two graphs are essentially hatching, hatchling fests, right? I mean, the models don't agree, especially in a fast action on climate change. We don't know whether some areas get wetter or whether some areas get drier. And our models don't even agree on the sign of the change. But even in a business as usual, there's still a lot of areas where you see hatching, where you see an unclarity between what the different models say. Um, Europe, in some models, gets wetter in a business as usual scenario. In some models, gets drier. And this is the thing where policymakers will come back to you, where politicians come back to you and say, well, go and do your homework again. We can't make policies based on these kinds of uncertainties. How can we ever adapt if you don't know what to adapt to. Right? So just to drive this home a, li a little bit again, I've, 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 I've gone into what the, um, the UK Met Office, and, and sorry, I'm really taking a UK approach here um, because that's the data I had. So the UK has done these climate projections where they looked at what the temperature regionally for the UK is going to be in the 2020s on a high emission scenario, so on a, on a business as usual scenario. And um, the left is, say, a minimum, the middle is, is, is the median, and the, the, the right is, say, the maximum temperature that we can expect by the 2020s. And as you see, it's actually it's not that much difference. It's anywhere from, say, half a degree or so of warming up to maybe two degrees of warming. So we're fairly focused in the coming decade what kind of temperatures we will see in the UK. But if you go to Rainfall, that's, that's very different. Well, I've, I, I've, I, I've now lived in London for a year. Rainfall is the thing that you want to think about. Rainfall is actually the thing that you care about if you live in London or anywhere else in the UK. And we don't even know whether rainfall for the UK is going to decrease or increase in the 2020s. We don't know whether we get 30% more rainfall on average or whether we get 10% less rainfall on average. So drive the point home. In the 2080s, if you look further into the future, it's, gonna, it, it, it's even worse. And then you see that there's the regional variability, the dry areas, the wetter areas. Um, there's a low chance that the Scotland might actually get a little bit drier, but we don't really know. And we have no idea whether southwest England, for instance, is getting 70% wetter. can't even imagine that's possible, but <laughs> apparently it, it is. Um, or whether it actually doesn't change very much. Again, repeating myself maybe a little bit, but this is the things 
that politicians ask of us and that we can't answer at the moment. So, in the five minutes that I have left, I um, just want to touch upon one other thing that again drives home this point about, uh, about, about, about regionality and about that the regions actually matter. And that's when we really get into the geopolitics of this. And this idea of geoengineering, right? So the, the royal solution to climate change is easy. It's just not burn fossil fuels, not put CO2 in the atmosphere. But there's other solutions to climate change. There's um, getting CO2 out of the atmosphere. There's planting trees. There's changing the albedo by painting your roofs white. There's all these kind of things. And the biggest elephant in the room um, in terms of how can we hack our climate, how can we what's called geoengineer our climate, is what's called solar radiation management. Solar radiation management is essentially the, the idea of, of changing the amount of sunlight that the Earth receives. And the question is, is this a good idea or not? Are we literally hacking our, our, our way out of cli climate change and what's it going to do? So I want to focus on, geo, on, on solar radiation management here because it is so easy to do. It is so cheap. I've once heard somebody say that if Mark Zuckerberg tomorrow wants to stop climate change, he can. He has the money by himself to stop any temperature rise. What you do is really simple. You mimic volcanoes. We know that after every big volcanic eruption, temperatures drop by half a degree to maybe a degree globally. Um, that's just because there's, uh, there's so much sulfur dioxide, particulate sulfur dioxide, into the upper atmosphere, into what we call the stratosphere, um, after each volcanic eruption that, that blocks the amount or, or that, that, that reduces the amount of sunlight actually hitting the surface of the Earth. And if you reduce the amount of energy coming in, then you can keep on putting CO2 in the atmosphere without actually the temperature rising. Now, we can't wait for volcanoes, of course. We can't trigger volcanoes, or probably we shouldn't. But we can actually have some kind of ballooning system where fairly cheaply, for say a few tens of millions of dollars a year, we can put enough sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere to block um, enough sunlight to offset the increase in CO2. So this literally is a, is a knob that we can turn that can change the amount of sunlight we receive and thereby the temperature we want. And it works. This is um, simulations, climate simulations that are done with um, virtual geoengineering, virtual solar ra radiation management. And you can see that even in the business as usual scenario, we can get the surface of the Earth roughly at zero degrees warming by 2100. So we can get, we can burn 2,000 more tons of more carbon dioxide. We can get into what would normally get us four or five degrees of warming, but offset it by these artificial volcanoes. But, and this is my last slide, and I think it's a real kicker, and this is why this is extremely dangerous. Even though we can control surface air temperature, we are going to see changes in atmospheric circulation. We are going to see changes in winds. We are going to see changes in rainfall patterns. Uh, oh, sorry, that way. And this is what rainfall in that in a, in a scenario where we actually limit uh, the temperature rise, this is what rainfall is going to do. It's going to very locally drastically decrease the amount of rainfall. It's going to decrease the amount of rainfall in areas that are extremely sensitive. It is going to decrease it in Brazil, in the Amazon. It's going to decrease it in sub-Saharan Africa. It's going to decrease it in Southeast Asia. Now, why I think this is so dangerous is because this suddenly becomes a local, this, 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 some, this suddenly becomes a tool for individual governments, individual people even, individual companies to tune their own um, climate if they would want to. To say if Australia tomorrow, for instance, think that it's going to be beneficial for them to do this because the rainfall is going to change or it's going to be better, um, they can do this, then there's nobody in the world to stop them. There's no way that we can actually not prevent a country to prevent the Maladives from putting this up and putting this sulfur dioxide high in the atmosphere. 
So this, I think, is the stuff of wars. And I think we should very carefully think about it. Thank you. So as we cross the halfway point, do you think we could revert this climate change? We start with Eric. Can we revert climate change? Yeah. Um, the status well, it depends on, on, on what part of climate change. So we know that we can't revert sea level rise. For instance, sea level rise, we've set into motion, we've, uh, we've put up the, 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 the flywheel that is the melting of Antarctica and Greenland. And I didn't show the slide here. I, I decided to put it out, um, to take it out at the end. But the interesting thing about sea level rise is that even in our best scenario, sea levels are going to continue to rise. And they are con co going to continue to rise very, very fast. And it's only going to accelerate even if we get to this magical RCP 2.6 scenario. So we're past the point of no return if we, if we worry about sea level rise. Temperature rise, yes, we could maybe do something about that. Um, biodiversity loss, again, the same problem, where there is so much happening already, and we are in, in, in a mass extinction at the moment. Um, it was a comment actually I want to make in, in the previous session about actually that if you want to mimic nature, you have to value nature first, um, which is not really what we seem to be doing uh, with all our, 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 our climate actions. So I'm quite pessimistic, I think. Okay. So from government's point of view, what do you think? Is um, something possible? Well, I guess the way I'm translating the question for myself is do we have the political motivation mm -hmm. to make the kind of deep structural changes that we would be needed? And I, I'm not even thinking about reversing, I'm thinking about reaching two degrees. Uh, and I, I personally feel that from what we see, unless there's an amazing technological fix, which kind of fits with current societal structures and priorities, I find it very difficult to see how that would happen because I don't think we've seen many, if any, examples of when a government has taken an approach such as leaving fossil fuels in the ground that has negative economic consequences. We can go with the win-wins. Mm -hmm. We can invest in the renewables, but have we seen anyone take a decision that has a short-term cost for a long-term gain. I don't think that we have, and so I would not see why you know, that's gonna happen unless something very dramatic changes. Either we really start to feel the impacts, public opinion starts to ramp up and that does somehow make political change, or we see a big technological fix that doesn't challenge the way society works, or I just have to say I'm also a little pessimistic about Okay. The trajectory. Well, you have to say you are. <laughs> yeah, you oh. need optimism. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps not the person to go to for that. Um, it's, a, it's a mitigation of science question you ask, and the science answer is there is already a certain concentration of greenhouse gas equivalents in the atmosphere, and we know that it's not going to dissipate in this century or in the next three centuries. So we're committed to that. Even if we went to zero emissions now, we're committed to some degree of climate change. Mm -hmm. So the simple answer to your question is no. But even if we could, we can't step in the same river twice. We've set in, mo in motion a number of international agreements and processes and commitments that are independent of attribution of climate change. So we've made commitments to the least developed countries that we're obliged to honor even if we went to zero, zero, degree, uh, zero emissions now. And we know that we are not in a position to go to zero emissions. Okay, thank you. So, yes, so we can start somewhere. I don't know where is the <laughs> catch box. Okay, yes, please. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so uh, I have a question for you, uh, Eric. Um, you had said something that uh, I found uh, very shocking and that was um, from the sense of surprise, not a confrontational shock. Um, and that was that no one cares about the temperature rise in the ocean, which um, as a lover of seafood, among other things, um, I find um, yeah. a bit surprising. And so I'm wondering how much of this is uh, scientific uh, no, no. hope so and how much is, is yeah. So we should care about the temperature in the ocean, absolutely. Um, and we should care about it because of seafood, as you say, but more, maybe even more importantly, we should care about it because um, up to 40% of all the sea level rise we see is just because the ocean is warming, and as it is warming, it is expanding, and it can only expand in one direction, which is up. 
So much of the sea level rise we see, even though it's not Greenland or, or melting or Antarctica melting, it is still the warming of the ocean. So um, maybe I said that a bit of a, a, a little bit too short. I, I just meant that, um, that there is this regional difference and that most people live on land. So if they think about their personal habitat, then that is what they experience. But temperature rise in the ocean is certainly important, yes. Sorry that I said that. <laughs> so if I may just follow up uh, a bit. So there are many communities, of course, that rely on their livelihood from uh, what is going on in the ocean. So um, is that something that are, is actively being considered or is that, or, or is the trouble on land so uh, so much more worrisome that that? No, no, issue? no, no. So, so, so I'm an oceanographer. Um, so I thought that I could make this comment because I'm an oceanographer and that kind of like excluding. Um, no, so, so, so I work with biologists, for instance, in looking at how in a warming ocean, um, different species are going to migrate forward. And we have some really interesting work about how, um, say, fish can move forward much faster than algae, say coral or, or um, kelp. And what, what's going to happen and what we, what we really fear is that you get displacements and new ecosystem introductions where, for instance, in a warming ocean, you get fish that normally live on, uh, on coral reefs. Because the ocean gets warm, they move forward. They get into an algal forest, a kelp forest, and suddenly they experience this new ecosystem, this new food source. And what we've seen, and we've already seen examples of that in Japan, for instance, where then suddenly these fish go crazy, literally, and they start eating away the entire kelp forest. And after a few months, you're left with a barren only. So at that point, the fish is essentially an invasive species. It's invasive because it was enabled by a warming ocean. Um, and you end up with, a, with an empty ecosystem almost. Uh, and that is absolutely worry. We worry about this all the time. We worry about ocean acidification. One of the things about the geoengineering is that even if you can fix temperature, you are not going to fix uh, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. So the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is going up and up and up, and that goes into ocean acidification. So the ocean is going to get more acidic, and that is going to impact uh, marine food webs too. Thank you. Okay. It's next. <laughs> it's easier. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, so my question is uh, really directed to both Eric and Susanna, and it's a question about um, oil price volatility and recent sort of record low, well not record lows, but low oil prices. Um, and how that factors into your, Eric, into your models of, of climate change, if it does factor into it at all, or whether it's just a short term blip that you don't need to worry about. And Susanna, likewise, really how that, if any, if, if at all affects governance and, and strategies. Well, yeah, so, so, so I can be short. So we get, so we as climate scientists, we get given a set of curves of emissions over time. Um, we don't, and that is by people who study exactly the kind of things that you are suggesting. Um, we just run through, we calculate through these, these set of curves and whatever comes out of them. Um, so it, it doesn't really factor into our things directly. In terms of um the way I would think about that, it, it would play into a range of factors that policymakers or other stakeholders are making around decisions. And often we see that people will make the kind of mitig you know, the mitigation decision if it aligns with other incentives, which are often economic incentives or other rationale. And with a lower oil price, the incentives are stacked the other way. So yes, it, it plays in in terms of how how people are translating their ideas into action, but they need the incentives to support that. And if the incentives are going the other way, it's going to stall action. Okay. Pass it on to him. Um, my question is uh, mainly for Eric, but it could have also implication for um, governance and uh, adaptation, if ever that suits. Um, I actually work in the Arctic region of Quebec, and uh, that's certainly a place where we hear and, and we witness what we believe is the results of climate change. Um, one of my question is that we sometimes hear that um, the Arctic is a bit like a 
could be seen as a thermostat for the Earth. Um, and you certainly have Inuit advocate like um, you know Sheila Watt Cloutier saying if you want to have the uh, the state of the health of our planet, you know, come to the Arctic and feel its pulse. So I was kind of wondering to what extent is that true and if so how and i was also intrigued by that little spot which seems to be near greenland which yeah. might not <laughs> rise as much so anyway any thoughts about that and maybe about implications yeah so so first of all about the arctic so the the, the, the arctic as most of my slides showed is going to warm twice as fast as the re, the, re, the, re, um, the rest of the world and that is the reason for that are are, have to do both with local, what we call alf albedo feedback, the ice albedo feedback, where if um, uh, ice, sea ice melts, and therefore the white shiny surface that reflects a lot of sunlight is going to, um, to be replaced by dark ocean that absorbs a lot of sunlight, and suddenly you've got a, a feedback, a positive feedback between more warming leading to less ice, leading to more exposed ocean, leading to more warming, leading to less ice. So, so that's a bit of a, a runaway effect that is very local. Then that stays local because of changes in atmosphere, atmospheric circulation. And that's the changes in the uh, jet stream, for instance, that we talked about. So it's quite complicated how that goes on. Um, but it is true that the Arctic is probably the most vulnerable place uh, to climate change. And, and everybody expects it to be the area where most uh, warming is going to happen. Then that, that blue blob, well, that is actually a really complicated story. I mean, it, it, we don't completely understand it yet. Um, some people say, yeah, just being taped, so I, I have to be a little bit careful. But um, if you've seen the day after tomorrow and the shutdown of the Gulf Stream, this is not that. So we're not going to see the day after tomorrow. We're not going to see the <laughs> stopping of the Gulf Stream. But a, a, a cold blob right in that location is in agreement with some of the things we think about changes to the Gulf Stream system. Um, so it is a little bit, you have to think about it in that way and change the ocean circulation, changes in how the heat is transported, and it leads to a very localized cold blob. Yes, you can pass on to her. <laughs> I have a question for you. Can you comment on why the precipitation models are so poor and don't agree very well? Again, a, a good question. Great, uh, great question. So, so what we think we understand about, uh, about precipitation is this concept of the wet get wetter and the dry get drier. Um, it's now fairly well established that in a warming world, because warm air can hold more moisture, you have more potential for water to be evaporated, to get up into the atmosphere, to then condense and to rain out. So there's going to be an increase in the amount of rain in some areas. There's going to be a decrease in the amount of rain in other areas. And then globally, I, I, I didn't show it here, but globally, we have a pretty good handle on that the Earth is going to get more precipitation on average. It's going to get wetter everywhere. But the thing is that precipitation is very, um, very hard to model because it is very localized, especially in the tropics. It's all about convection. It's about storms that are maybe a few kilometers in diameter um, that are really small scale um, that just don't f literally don't fit on our models. Our model resolution is too big to simulate, to accurately simulate this convection. So we can't do that, and, and therefore on the global scale, or even on the, on the regional scale, we, we miss where those clouds actually dump their water. So we know there's going to be more clouds, we know there's going to be more humidity, but where it gets dumped exactly is extremely difficult to model. Okay. Yes, please. Actually, Eric, it's, a, it's another question for you. It's, it's about modeling uh, and computer modeling. Uh, it's, I want to sound a, a flippant comment, but would it be better if we focused our attentions on developing better computer power for modeling rather than for board games in light of AlphaGo recently? There's a lot of attention on you know, computing power in that sense, but you know, would it benefit to have a similar effort for climate change modeling? Yeah, so we are 
if you really want to fully model the climate system up to the scales where it actually matters. If we want to, if we want to, what we call close the equations. So we, so we can write down exactly the equations that govern uh, fluid dynamics. I, I, if, if, if you give me a, a whiteboard here, I could write down a few, few boards full, but we have it. The problem is that there is a scaling there. there, there there's a feedback between the really small scales and the really big scales. Now, the small scales in the ocean and in the atmosphere are what we call the Komogorov scale, and that's 10 to the minus 5 meters. So it's, it's, it's a, few, um, a few tens of millimeters in, the, in the diameter. The biggest scale, obviously, is the size of our planet. It's a few thousand kilometers. So we have, a, a, we, we have to actually, if you want to do it properly, if we actually want to solve the equations, we have to solve over 10 to the 25 or so orders, or yeah, so over 25 orders of magnitude. Our current models are doing maybe only five or six. So we're not nearly where we need to be to close our models. And it means that it's not so much about cl getting closer to the Gomagor scale as it is to get better at somehow what we call parameterization of the unresolved physics. So whatever happens inside those grid cells, inside those Lego boxes, we need to make simple physical assumptions about those, what we call parameterizations, and that is what we need to get better at, at how do we model a cloud that we don't actually resolve? How do we get it to actually dump the rain where we want it to be? Uh, just a question for Susanna. I think it's maybe two questions, or perhaps it's one question. I th it's about the difference between, I suppose, uh, uh, that was Eric was raising in part about uh, probability versus certainty. And for politicians, of course, they can always get away or, or find the perfect excuse for not making certain decisions or following up on certain policies because they say, well, the modeling is such that we have, it's, it's probable, uh, you know, 70 or whatever percent, but, you know, given that there's a 30 percent escape hatch here, why should we act on this? So how does one avoid that kind of political political legitimation of inaction. And on the other hand, um, the, the, what you were raising the last point in your presentation about a kind of anti-politics, and you were saying, and, and quite rightly, I think saying, you know, an anti-politics is itself a politics. And, and the solution is one that would be, an anti-politics would be kind of technocratic. In other words, that you have uh, technocrat scientists who are making decisions on behalf of politicians and that politicians are bound to follow, but that's also deeply undemocratic. And whenever we've seen this historically, it's led to all kinds of problems problems and pathology, socially and politically. So I, th those two things, I guess, I'm interested in, in those two dynamics of politics in, in that way. So. I got caught up in your second one. The first one was, uh, sorry, just give me the, the snapshot of the first Well, one. The, the difference between, you know, when we're talking about probability okay. versus certainty How and in terms of political yeah. decision making, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I think there's quite a lot of work now about how you need to plan in a different way to take an account of that. So there's been some interesting studies done on the um, Thames barrier in the UK about how do you make a decision, you know, we have a, a barrier that stops London flooding. Um, and they needed to make a decision about increasing the height, but they didn't know how high they should increase it. Uh, and instead of putting off the decision, what they did was built a kind of iterative process. So they, they built it up a bit, and then they kind of built a five-year um, iteration process to reconsider the evidence and see if they needed to increase it. So I think that the only way to get around this issue of uncertainty stopping action is to take this more kind of policy-first um, approach to the questions, to say, what do we know now? What does that tell us enough about where we're going? And then how can we do the process in a way that we can take account of emerging information? So, of course, it's challenging, but we have to get beyond this feeling of we don't know everything, so we can't do anything. Um, and your second point, yeah, on the anti-politics. So, just to be clear, I'm, I'm not advocating for an anti-politics. I think that's we're seeing a huge technicalization of the issue of climate change and it being handed over... Uh, at some point to the climate scientists, but also hugely to economists and to very dominant models around how economies um, will, will, will look in different ways. Um, and, and so I think, yes, we need to, to recognize that it's a political issue. And that seems kind of logical in some contexts like here, where you might be talking about oil and tar sands, and those political issues are very present. But 
In, in other countries where it, it plays out in a different form of politics, more closely linked with international development aid, um, it, it, it seems to me has gone into a more technocratic discourse and it needs to be something that um, the, the country takes hold of as a political issue and it finds a consensus around what, they, what they're looking for in terms of transformative pathway and it doesn't just get you know, another part of development, more kind of seemingly apolitical money that is actually hugely political. Um, so, thanks to all of you um, for those talks. I was going to ask something, it picks up on something Eric said, but it's actually addressed to, to our other speakers. And it's um, basically, Eric mentioned geoengineering uh, and it being an elephant in the room. And so it's a slightly open-ended question. Given that there may be, I mean, no one's saying there is, but let's say there may be a technical solution where we can put in X amount of money and get X amount of uncertainty back about what impact it might have, but it would address a certain aspect of climate change. How good is it to have this on the table? What effect does this have on the climate change um, politics uh, or, or the way that the policy works? I think it's a, a red herring to call it a technical, a technical question because it's a geopolitical question. Um, we do not have an international structure for this. What the few international organizations we have to negotiate on these are not working. The United Nations hasn't been able to deal with the much more straightforward mitigation issue. So while technically it's possible, um, I don't think it has enough traction, except among some outliers, to become an excuse for mitigation. I don't see it seriously being proposed. However, as Eric pointed out, there can be nation states, there can be individuals who go rogue. And that is a, a serious concern. I don't think it is on the agenda as a, unlike carbon capture and storage, which is much less controversial in terms of the secondary effects of it, but also much more expensive and not feasible at this point. But to present it as a technical question, I think does it a disservice because it is, it's a geopolitical question. I agree with that. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I think okay. very well said. Thanks. Any other question from the audience? Yes. So, have people started speculating about what might happen if countries go rogue, so to speak? And because it, in in, his, in history, we've, we've we've seen that when problems have arisen, um, in the absence of some overarching sort of global organisation, someone has tried to become that. Um, and has, so, has anyone thought forward about you know what might be coming? And inside governments. Are they, presumably, they're starting to think about this. Is there any evidence of that? There are certainly scholars working on this. I'm not one of them. I think the only, um, what gives me some comfort is that solar radiation management is a relatively short-lived solution. So if a country goes rogue within two years, we're back to where we were. So solar radiation management would only be a long-term technical solution if we continued shooting up these rockets into the stratosphere. So even if a country, uh, I'll get the scientific challenge right there. <laughs> Wait a minute, yeah. No, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. finish your point or? Okay. Because you want to say something about So that. even if we did have a country go rogue, I am optimistic enough to think that there are checks and balances in place and enough political pressure, but I have no evidence for saying that. Okay, so, so I'm going to follow up that yes, indeed, um, the sulfur dioxide will rain out, and it will rain out after, say, two years or so. But the, but the worrying thing is that if you continue to put CO2 in the atmosphere, then what we get after that two years is an imbalance between the temperature that we have and the temperature that the CO2 would allow. And that's going to lead to rapid temperature rise, which is even faster, which is up to five or six times faster than what you would get if you wouldn't do the solar radiation management at all. So essentially the, the result is that once you start, you're hooked, you can't stop. And the longer you wait with stopping, the worse it becomes to stop. It is literally a drug that we get addicted to, and there's no way to stop it because as long as the CO2 is just building up in the atmosphere, the, the sulfur dioxide is the only thing that protects us from super fast warm-up, warm-up that is much faster, much more detrimental to ecosystems. Correct, I, I agree with that. In that we would then be looking at a 
temporal scale of climate change that is not possible for natural systems to adapt to. But my point is that given that this is not something that is done in secret or that can be done in secret, we have analogs of this. The Mount Punatuba eruption in 1992 is an analog for solar radiation management. And if it was one or two of these small scale events, I don't think we'd be hooped right away. But as soon as we go down that path as a global solution, I fully agree, we're hooped. Before you ask, I have something to ask in continuity, so I better ask yeah. him now. But Eric, when you're talking about uh, solar energy management, so you talked about nature mimic, but it seems to be more of a nature block because you block the solar energy, right? So how's it? how does it translate to mimicking nature? You're well, no, no, yeah, yeah. So we mimic volcanoes. Okay. Um, so volcanoes do this all the time. And as, as Joanna also said, uh, Punitubo um, lowered global mean temperatures by 0.7 degrees or so. And that's, that's significant, right? That uh, essentially within a few years undid all of climate change we've done since the, um, since the last, uh, so since the Industrial Revolution. So in that sense, we, we mimic something that is occurring naturally yeah okay thank you yes yeah. so this is a very naive uh <laughs> question um why is it sulfur oxide that is being discussed and not maybe more innocuous things like water vapor i mean if you were to artificially inject water vapor produce clouds um to create rain. I mean, so why, why is it such an extreme uh, material that's being discussed? That's a very good question. I, I don't know. I, it could be that the analog is the volcanoes. Um, to be honest, my atmospheric chemistry is just not up to par to answer this at this point. Sorry. Can I just ask quickly on this? So to, to learn about this then, are people using the natural experiments of volcanoes, essentially? Or can you also kind of work on it experimentally? Well, yeah, so um, it's actually quite interesting that um, there was a group in the UK who wanted to do this, and who to do this on a small scale. And in the end, there was so much of a backlash, and there was so much of a uh, ethics issue that they, they had to stop, and they, they shut down their own so research. Did you do that over the UK? Well, yeah, they Somewhere. just wanted to, so, so, so they wanted to test the delivery system. They wanted to just see right. what kind of delivery system. And it's, it's, it, it gets discussed in the, uh, in the hallways in, in conferences, climate science conferences. We discuss about the ethics of, of studying this. Should we study this or should we just stay away from it? Um, one of the questions about getting our regional modeling better and getting better at it and getting more confident about exactly regional patterns is that it can play into, into politicians who actually then see, oh, well, now I'm certain that the climate is going to be um, good for my country if I, if I put sulfur dioxide in the, in, in the atmosphere. And there's a lot of my colleagues who just don't even want to mention it. They, they don't want to touch this and don't really like to speak about it even. Thank you. Any other question? Yes. Okay, no problem. So what does this, well, depends on who you are. So um, if you are in the UK or if you're here in Canada or if you're, if you're Dutch like me, then it probably doesn't mean that much. Climate change, in my view, and, and, and I'm really more talking as, as, as a person, I guess, than as a scientist, is very much it's about it's about the investment, the infrastructure we've laid down, and we have to abandon that infrastructure. We have to move our countries, uh, we have to move our, uh, sorry, our cities inland. Now, the pace at which climate change is happening, on the one hand, uh, Susanna said it, the slowness of it makes it very hard to, to get policies in place, but on the other hand, it also gives us some lead time. Um, so if we're thinking about 50, 60, 70 centimeters of sea level rise, then for, for countries like Holland, for instance, that is acceptable, that is doable. The, the Dutch have officially said that we have the engineering in place to do this. We'll, we'll just raise our dikes 
I, I was born two meters below sea level, and that's perfectly normal, right? I mean, you, you can cope with that. The Thames barrier is another thing. We'll, we'll just raise the thing. We have the money for that. The real problem is that if you don't have the money to adapt, if you don't just raise your dikes, if you live in Bangladesh and you can't do that, and that is where this whole issue of fairness comes back and where it's, it's as, as Susanna said, climate change is very, is very much the making of the developed world, but it's also only the developed world that can properly adapt to this, and that's super unfair. Any other questions? Okay, yes, please. <laughs> I have a loud voice, but this is close by. Um, so this is actually perhaps going a little bit towards Susanna. You were talking a lot about uh, less developed nations, but uh, during the Scottish, uh, well, post the Scottish referendum discussion, we had a lot of discussion around smaller nations, which are not the same thing as less developed, but have a lot of the same political type problems. I and mean, they're not as, they can't bring the amount of pressure the United States can, for example, against these sort of concepts. Uh, and so there's a lot of concern, you know, what would happen if Scot Scotland became one of these smaller nations and how would they uh, join in with the larger community in terms of things like NATO and, and things around climate change. And so I'm curious why you decided to, to say this less developed as opposed to just smaller um, different governments and what impact do you think that has? Okay. Well. I think for me, they would present quite different questions. So the fact of being a smaller nation has essentially an impact on your role in international relations. So yes, what if Scotland chooses to go independent in the future, you know, will they be a significant voice? Um, but Scotland, as an example, still has you know, a range of financing, infrastructure, government systems that allow it to deliver um, policy in a way that the least developing countries are still working on. So I think, you know, the choice of the least developing countries is really about those countries that are going to feel the effects of climate change worse. So those are the communities who are living, you know, on the coastal areas of Bangladesh who are already experiencing cyclones and it's going to be, um, you know, quite significant. So in a way, our, our research choice is really a kind of a bit normative in that sense, in that we know these countries are going to suffer the worst. They're the places where we really need to plan for adaptation. How can that best be supported? And I think in terms of the international relations issue, um, sometimes countries can ap apply a kind of moral pressure or a moral standing which gives them a much higher voice or kind of amplifies their stance more than it would be. So the least developed countries are a block within the UNFCCC, for example, that I think has been gaining traction for a kind of high moral stance on, you know, on, on mitigating and, and trying to lead the way through these low carbon resilient development strategies. And potentially that's something like smaller nations, which are more progressive, could also see a way forward as, as amplifying their voice around um, particular issues by kind of taking a, a moral stance. <laughs> 